first realised something had gone very wrong with football. It's in 2008, the European Championship. It's qualifying. Netherlands against Russia. You might remember the Netherlands in a good stage played very well. They've beaten Italy, they've beaten France. People were saying that maybe this was the best Dutch team for 20 years. Russia had been up and down, but they beat beaten Sweden very convincingly in the third group game. They played in the great tradition of the Russian game, way of the way of attack forward forward till, till Sweden were washed away. It was made to be an epic, and it was, it was a great game. Russia played very well, took the lead. Later on, we got this away for ice. It looked like Russia's nerve, maybe he'd gone. Game went to extra time. So, Will Russia hold it together? Yes, they did. Andrew Sharp was magnificent. They scored twice, they three one up. And then, three or four minutes from time, I glanced up at my laptop, saw the big screen. And on the big screen, two Dutch fans. And they saw themselves, one of them the most of them. And the other one looked, and he grinned, and waved. Three minutes to go, his team's about to go out of the European Championship, and he grinned, and waved. Three minutes to go, of a team, possibly the best I've seen for 20 years, and they're about to go out, not just any team, but to a team who are actually playing the Dutch style, they're playing to the ideal of total football, better than the Netherlands. And he grins and waves. He's not raging against it. He's not trying to urge his team forward. He's grinning and waving, delighted to see himself on the screen. And I thought, this, this, is, this is wrong, this is very odd. But then this was happening all the time. The final. Spain against Germany. Spain, about to end half a century of failure, half a century of underachieving great players. But against Germany, Germany famously, relentlessly, they come, they come, they come, they grind it down. Five minutes to go, Spanish fans should have been terrified. They should have been praying for that final whistle. Big screen, Spanish fan, grinning and waves. <laughs> where were the nerves? Where was the anxiety? He was grinning and waving. It wasn't just that one. The World Cup happened every game. Champions League final um, in, in Madrid. Bayern Munich. No, no German team had got beyond the semi finals in 2002. There's Bayern Munich playing into it. They played at the park. They should be distraught. This is a once in a generation opportunity. Disappeared. Fan on the screen. Grins and waves. So I thought, why is this? And I realised. This is actually what UEFA wants, it's what FIFA wants, because it's what television wants. They want the fan to be there as a backdrop. They want him there in his shirt, face painted ideally. They want him grinning and waving. And this seems to me is a great portrayal of football as a people's game. And the soul of that game was expressed through fans and the terraces. If you go back to Soviet times, the crowd, paradoxically, was where an individual could be individual away from the scrutiny of the state. The terraces became a locus for dissent. But even in non-totalitarian countries, across the world, the terrace was where the soul of the people whose game this was was expressed. Through chance, through wit, through banter. No, of course it went, went too far at times. Of course, you know, there was violence, and of course that was a very, very bad thing. But surely better to run the risk of that and have the soul there, and have this corporate nonsense, have fans who apparently their greatest inspiration is to look like they're in a MasterCard outfit. So you might think, okay, this is this is FIFA, this is UEFA. The fan who goes to watch his local team, he's still expressing something that old soul of football, football as the people's game. And you know, certainly that was true. Six months ago, I was preparing the eulogy for my father's funeral, and I thought, which were the occasions on which I was closest to my father? And pretty much all of them were football. And that is, is a key thing in what football was about. It's about linking generations. I was close to my father's, he'd been close to his father's, he'd been close to his father through watching football. Football gave us a way of expressing an emotion that we found difficult to express in other ways. It pulled generations together. It also pulls communities together. I speak from Solomon because that's why I'm from, what I know. I imagine this is true for, for most other places. But Solomon was a you know, great industrial city. It was held together by the mines, by the shipyards, 
you could go to anywhere in the world, you could go to Sydney, you could go to Rio, and you would see a ship that came from Sodom. We felt very proud of that. Those are now gone. It's difficult to be proud of another Nissan Micro on the production line of another call centre. But the football team still allows the city to unite. Outside the Stadium of Light, there's a rather beautiful statue. It shows a family. A mother, a father, their two kids. Probably in the 30s, black cap, red back bones, and they're holding along just the globe looks like a football. And the inscription around the base said, a tradition that echoes the generations. And in that way, the football club becomes a locus for the soul of the, of the town. It becomes a repository for the soul of the town. Now you may say that doesn't exist, and to an extent possibly it does, but even that is being eroded. In 2008, Manchester City released figures that show the average age of their season ticket holders in the previous decade had gone up by eight years. So between 1999 and 2008, the average age of the season ticket holder in the city had increased by eight years. Now all that tells you is that the same people are still going to the games. It's not being passed to the next generation. That link, that pulling together the generations, is being eroded. It's not there anymore. And that is eating away at the soul of the game. Because those kids who aren't going to games, and it's very obvious why they aren't going. When I first started going to Sunderland, I paid £2.50 for Sunderland Terrace behind, behind the goal at the Oakland. £2.50, anybody can afford. You know, you collect up your pocket money, you collect up your wage and your paper round. Anybody can afford it. These days you're talking about 16, 17, 18, 19 pounds for a good game. Look that up by 19 over the season. It's up to 350 pounds, who can afford that? So if they're not going to games, they're watching games on the TV. So they're not feeling that bond with love of music, they're not feeling that bond with love of love. They'll start supporting the team who wins, the team who's on most often. Effectively, they're supporting a brand, not a club. And there's nothing more opposed to the idea of the soul of the team than the brand. So this, this, you know, this is a really key, key issue. So this, the brand has overtaken the club. The fan has become a consumer. That is where the soul has gone. Football used to be the people's game. Now it's become a corporate game. And those people who are standing there, grinning and waving, they're waiting goodbye to the soul of football. 